Hi everyone and welcome to NYU Abu Dhabi. Uh, as many of you know me, I'm a member of um, Dr. Doug Dorr's lab. Um, we work on malaria. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk to you about lipid metabolism and how lipid could play a very important role in the fate of infection and the disease progression. So malaria is a very devastating disease, one of the oldest diseases that mankind have ever known. 95% of the malaria cases and deaths uh, related cases, they're concentrated in Africa. While 77% of these cases are in children below the age of five. And every two minutes, a child dies of malaria. And that's how devastating this disease is. And this is pictures from the villages in West Africa. As you can see here, there are puddles in the homes of these, in the huts where, the, where uh, people live. And the larvae in these puddles, the larvae of the mosquitoes that carries Plasmodium falciparum, one of the main culprits behind malaria infection, is in these, um, in these puddles. So you can, you can really see how devastating this disease could be. Now, today, I'm gonna to talk to you about how lipid can determine the fate of infection or play a very important role. But before that, I have to emphasize two things. One is that these are two eukaryotic systems. So the host and the parasite, Plasmodium falciparum parasite and the host, they're both eukaryotic systems. They fight for the same, um, for the same nutrients, for the same essential um, compounds that are needed for the growth and development. The other thing, is that the parasite, while it invades the red blood cell, it can, um, it can uh, introduce surface, different surface proteins on the surface of a red blood cell to make sure that all the nutrients that it needs for its growth and development can flux into the infected red blood cell. Not only that, it fights and it competes for amino acid uh, metabolism with the host and it results into hemoglobin degradation to, in order for, uh, to obtain all the amino acids that it needs for its growth. However, these are not the only components that play a role in the fate of infection. Amino, um, sorry, um, the immune system and the immune response plays a very important role here. So we have three components. We have the red blood cells that plays a host for the parasite. We have the parasite that competing with the host for all these nutrients, and we have also the immune response. Now, this is why me and uh, my colleagues, Aisatu, Masar, and Darin, we went to West Africa with one question in mind that we wanted to understand. Why there are different, uh, there are variation in how the, um, uh, in how the uh, human response to the infection. And the whole idea was that we would collect samples from, um, from different ethnic groups from uh, West Africa and the study design that we follow is that we would go during the dry season and then we would collect samples from, uh, from children be, uh, between the ages of five and 12. And then these children, they're not infected. We follow up with them on a longitudinally and then we try to see, um, we test them on a bi-weekly basis and we see if these kids, they get, um, they get infected. As if they get infected, then we sample them again. And we collect the blood sample and then we collect from these blood samples, we process it, and we collect the serum. And we are, as a lab, we are an omics lab. We like a zoom out approach. So we zoom out, we look at all the changes that are happening in, we're after all the changes that are happening, and then we try to identify all the different components that play a role in the fate of infection. And that's exactly what we did. We collected uh, from here, from um, uh, 100 uh, children, uh, during the dry season, we collected 100 uh, blood samples and serum samples, and then we follow up with, uh, with the children during the, uh, the wet season, that's where the transmission of malaria is very high, and then we collected blood and serum samples from them again, and the idea was to do high resolution metabolomic profiling, and lipidomic profiling, and transcriptomic profiling. This is a massive um, study, the reason why, because it's matched. We're looking at the same individuals before they were infected and during the infection. So this is very important. We're not doing a cross-sectional. And we have three different omic sets. 
metabolomics using liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry. And these are two different methods compared to the lipidomic prof uh, profiling, which uses gas chromatography and mass uh, spectrometry. And the reason why is that we wanted to dig deep. You can detect some lipids with metabolomic profiling. However, with gas chromatography, you can really achieve high resolution in the lipidomic data and try to see what are the changes that are happening during the infection in the same child. And this is what we did. So we have here the samples. We did the global metabolomic and lipidomic profiling. And this is the outcome of the profiling. So we have um, about 700 metabolites that we detected. As you can see here, one third of them are lipids, which is very intriguing. And then we have, this is the outcome of the uh, lipidomic profiling, and we have here about 1,000 lipid molecules that we were able to detect. And this is a PCA that shows the metabolomics data. And as you can see here, it shows the status here in blue, this is the, um, uh, the children before infection. It represents, each dot represents the uh, metabolome of one child before uh, the child was infected. And here uh, in red, it represents the metabolomes of these children during the infection. And as you can see here, there is a clear segregation and separation. So it tells us that there are changes that are happening in the metabolome. And looking at the lipidomic data, you can see the same segregation that we can see the, uh, the, uh, meta the lipidomes of these children cluster, the, they cluster together before infection, um, almost uh, the, like the segregation is very clear uh, compared to their lipidomes during the infection. Another thing that we did, which very, um, it was very um, um, surprising to us, is that when we did the transcriptomic data, the idea was to do a joint transcriptomic data. There are crosstalk between the parasite and the host. And the idea of looking at the gene expression of the parasite alone, separate from what happens in, uh, in, the, ho in the gene expression uh, profiles of the host during infection, um, the idea to achieve both at the same time is very intriguing. And that's what we were after. We were trying to um, look at the profiles of gene expression in both the host and the parasite at the same time. And that's what we did. We isolated RNA from the blood of, uh, the peripheral blood of these children before infection and during infection. And what you're looking at here, um, uh, so uh, this is high parasitemia. Of course, before infection, we want to see that there's no parasites. Uh, we cannot, um, we, we don't see any parasite transcripts. However, during infection, we want to see that there are transcripts. So we did, what you see here, this is a bioanalyzer um, plot, and the idea was to see the 18S, the ribosomal RNA, how much can we detect of the human compared to uh, the parasite. And what you see here is that this is a plot. In red here, it represents the ribosomal, R, the 18S and the 28, um, 28S uh, ribosomal units for the human, and in yellow, it represents the 18S and the 28S units for the parasite. And you can see the, the levels of RNA that we can detect for the parasite at high parasitemia. This is a child who has a lot of parasites in their blood. Um, is very comparable, it's very, like very close to each other. So that's, that's amazing. Even in low parasitemia, we were able to detect um, low levels of the transcript. So we were able to achieve that being able to look at the gene expression profiles for the parasite and the, the host during the infection. And what you see here, this is a histogram. And this is here on the y-axis represents the number of uh, transcripts that we have. This is all the individuals that uh, before they were infected. And in, in blue here, this is the total reads. This is all the reads that we can detect in the transcriptomic data that we have. And the red here represents these transcripts that are uniquely mapped to human. What we did is that when we isolated the total, uh, the total RNA from the children before infection and during infection, we mapped it to both the human genome and the parasite genome. And the idea we were gonna take the, the transcripts that are uniquely mapped to the human genome and the ones that are uniquely mapped to the parasite genome. And that's what we did. So here you can see there's not almost none 
Uh, none of the samples, they had um, any Plasmodium falciform uniquely mapped reads, and all of them, almost all of them, are from the human, um, uh, human reads. And during infection, you can see here what changes. You can see in total, uh, this is the blue, it shows each, each one, it shows the number of reads for every individual. Uh, total reads, and in red it shows the human reads, and in black it shows the plasmodium falciparum genes. After filtering the data, we have almost 12,000 human genes and almost 2,000 plasmodium genes. So now we're ready to analyze. Now I have lipidomic data, metabolomic data, and transcriptomic data. And I'm gonna tell you two stories. The first one is about immune response and the lipid role the, uh, the, the role that the lipids play in the immune response, determining the fate of infection. And the second one is about the parasite pathogenicity and what the lipids, um, how the lipids are very important for the development um, of the parasite. So very intriguing observation that I noticed is that 32% of the lipids, uh, sorry, 32% of the metabolites that were significantly associated with infection and also associated with parasitemia. That means these are the lipids that increase in the preferred blood when uh, we have higher parasitemia. So 32% were steroids. And that's very intriguing to me because look at here, this is the concentration. Every column represents one individual. And here, this is a set of 12 steroids, pregnant alone steroids. These are steroids that they can be made by the brain, um, synthesized by the brain, the, the gonads, and the adrenal gland, and lymphocytes. What we see here, the concentration represents the concentration in all of 100 children before infection. And as you can see here, there is a very a strong elevation, significant elevation in the concentration of these steroids. Not only that, as I mentioned, they're associated with parasitemia. The higher the levels of these steroids, the, the, sorry, the higher the parasitemia, the parasite count in the blood, um, the peripheral blood of these children, the higher the levels of these steroids. And that's very interesting. You, we have an infection. The immune system is trying to fight the, an infection. And at the same time, the higher the number of the parasite, the higher the level of the steroids. Why would an anti-inflammatory steroids be swarming around the blood, uh, the peripheral blood. Why, what's the function of these? So that intrigued me to look at the correlation between all these steroids and the lymphocyte count and the different other different components of the immune system during infection. And I was able to see that there's a very significant negative correlation between the lymphocyte count and the steroids. So now I have Higher number of parasites, higher, number, higher level of steroids, and at the same time, lower number of lymphocytes. And this is a correlation that I can only see during infection. I did not see before infection. So what is the role that these, at this point, that these steroids play? At this point, all of what I'm seeing right now is association and it doesn't mean causation. So what I did is I took these 11 steroids and I took all the transcriptomic data that we detected in these individuals before infection and during infection, only the human transcriptomic data, and I correlated between, between, the, between the two, 11, 000, uh, 11 steroids and 12,000 genes. And I correlated between the gene expression profiles before infection and during infection. And the idea was to ask one question. What are the signaling, immune signaling pathways that I can detect that are associated with this infection-induced steroid response? Because apparently, this is what, the infection is causing that to happen because it, was, it did not exist in the first place. And here I identified a set of genes that were correlated before infection, and this could be positive correlation or negative correlation. And I identified also another set of genes that are correlated with these steroids during infection. I took the two sets and I did enrichment analysis and tried to see which pathways are enriched before and during infection 
And to my surprise, none of these genes before, that were shown to be associated with the steroids before infection showed any significant upregulation or downregulation of any of these immune signaling pathways. However, during infection, I was able to see that there are significant inhibition of T cell activation signaling pathways and significant activation of T cell exhaustion signaling pathways. And the whole, at, at this point, still is an association. I tried to prove that there is a causation here. And the question that I asked, is the impact of these steroids on lymphocytes is mediated by an impact on gene expression? These anti-inflammatory steroids, are they causing different or changes or perturbation in the gene expression that of, of the genes that belong to these signaling pathways that we identified in the enrichment pathway. And I did a mediation analysis. And the idea was to, we have the steroid level and we have the lymphocyte count, which we see that they're correlated. And the idea was to bring a gene expression in the middle between the two. And we test if the effect of the prognosis sul uh, sulfate, which is one of the steroids, on the lymphocyte count, which is negative effect, is mediated by its effect on the, gene, on the gene expression, whether by inhibition or activation. And indeed, the mediation analysis showed that there is a very strong um, mediation effect of the steroids on the, gene um, on the lymphocyte that is mediated by its effect on the gene expression. And so overall, what we were able to see, and we also took that to the lab where we tested the proliferation of the T cells in the presence and absence of these steroids. And we were able to show that the signaling pathways that belong to C T cell exhaustions are being upregulated when we add these steroids. And the T cells uh, proliferation and even cytokine uh, uh, cytokines by synthesis is being downregulated when we add these steroids to the PBMCs. And um, you can check uh, the paper if you're interested um, uh, for further analysis. We also uh, showed that these steroids, they have different variation between different ethnic groups that can incorporate to um, uh, resistance to malaria. Now, I'm gonna move on to the next story. And the next story was intrigued by two things. One I mentioned earlier is that one third of these metabolites that we were detected were lipids. The second one, which we also showed in this paper, is that there is a very significant depletion of long chain fatty acids conjugated with carnitine. These are fatty acids that they're channeled into the mitochondria by carnitine. And these fatty acids, the long chain fatty acids, can be used for two things. Whether it's used for phospholipid biosynthesis or it can be used for beta oxidation. Now, what is happening with these, with these uh, fatty acids? And here, this is a volcano plot that shows that the long chain fatty acids are being depleted uh, during an infection, while the short chain fatty acids are being channeled out of the mitochondria, which usually channeled uh, out of the mitochondria. They're being um, uh, enriched into the blood of these children during, an, during an infection. And also you can see here, not only it drops during infection, the long chain fatty acids, they also negatively correlated with the parasite. So the higher the number parasite that we can detect, the lower the number of these fatty acids. So that intrigued me to look more at the lipidomic data at a higher resolution. So, but before I get into this, I mentioned that these fatty acids, they can be used by, for the phospholipid biosynthesis. And phospholipids, this is an example of a polyunsaturated uh, phospholipid. They have a glycerol backbone and two acyl chains that are attached to two carbons on this backbone. Usually in our body, in any eukaryotic systems, one of these is, unsatura is saturated and another one is unsaturated. And then that changes. There are enzymes that remove and chops these acyl chains and then changes it 
with other saturated or unsaturated, long or length, uh, long or short uh, fatty acids, that depending on the need of, uh, of the organism. And as you can see here in the host, the phospholipids, the, uh, they're different, uh, so we have here different components, uh, phosphatidylcholine, ethanolamine, they represent uh, uh, about 40% and 35% of the membrane. Uh, and here, this number is actually elevated as soon as these red blood cells, they're infected. And not only that, the phospholipids, they're very important for the sexual commitment. The parasites, as soon as they feel stress and there are limited nutrients and limited lipids, they go into sexual commitment. They, they commit to becoming gametes and instead of dividing asexually. And this is what we, saw, what we saw in the lipidomic data. We have here that the triglycerides, most of the upregulated lipids, they're triglycerides, and most of the downregulated lipids are phospholipids. That's nothing new. What we see here is nothing new. This is what we have known from literature all along, and that made me look at how much of these lipids are associated with parastemia. And I was able to identify 47 lipids that are associated with parasitemia. One third of them are phospholipids. And as you can see here, these are all the individuals ranked from low to high parasitemia. And as you can see here, this is one class of phospholipids that shows depletion when we have higher parasitemia. The higher the parasite count, the lower the concentration of these phospholipids. However, and this is what's new, we showed another subclass of phospholipids that are being upregulated or enriched in the blood when we have more, um, uh, when we have more parasite count. And what I wanted to know is what are the difference between the two subclasses. So I did an enrichment analysis for, to look at uh, how much of these, um, so the only difference that could be between these subclasses is the number of carbons that they have in the acyl chains and the number of double bonds that they have. So I checked for enrichment of specific acyl chains in these lipids. And I looked first in the enriched, um, in enriched lipids. Um, here I did not find any significant um, enrichment of a particular acyl chain. However, I found particular en enrichment, very significant, of one particular fatty acid that represent, that always exists in the composition of these phospholipids. And that, intrigued me to look more at what is actually happening and what is the role of this particular uh, acyl uh, chain. So I did this, I followed the same uh, protocol and I took these 47 lipids and I correlated them, but this time with the gene expression profiles of the host and parasite during infection. And I did enrichment analysis for all the genes that showed uh, to be associated with these lipids and the idea was to ask, is there any lipid metabolism pathways that are enriched in host or the parasite? And here in the human, none of these pathways showed to be related to lipid metabolism. However, in the parasite, four different pathways are related to the parasite. 26 genes showed in these uh, pathways. And this is me trying to figure out, to zoom out, and try to understand what is actually happening. This is a membrane and of the parasite, and trying to visualize these 26, the roles, and to connect the dots between the, diff the roles of these different uh, lipids. And what we see here, different pathways that are responsible for the biosynthesis of the, these phospholipids that make up the plasma membrane of the parasite and the infected red blood cell. And what you see here in red, these are all the genes that were detected that belong to the 26 genes that showed before in the enrichment of the parasite. And this tells me that all of these, and gives me great confidence to say that all the 47 lipids that I showed earlier, and particularly the phospholipids, they are associated with parastemia. And the genes, these are responsible about the biosynthesis of these lipids and the remodeling of these lipids. They change the acyl change components that, uh, uh, that exist on the structure of these lipids. So all the genes in red here, they exist in the 26 gene set uh, that I showed earlier. And then I zoomed in. 
If you recall, I showed one enrich significant enrichment of one particular acyl chain. And the idea was to see is any of these genes could have any connection with that acyl chain uh, biosynthesis or at least remodeling. And indeed, I found one gene. This gene in plants and in human, it has high specificity for this particular acyl chain. And so again, another level of confidence that shows. And finally, um, I took this to the lab. So I wanted to uh, understand the role of this acyl chain and how it can impact the pathogenicity of the disease. And right now, so uh, I, would, I would like to thank Maria and Sarul and Dariga, and particularly Maria and the, uh, the Carlton Lab for transferring the knowledge of culturing the parasite in our lab. And what I did here is that I had, um, I developed, uh, I cultured the parasite, and then I, sub, um, I designed an experiment, uh, an experiment that tests for the, uh, for the role of uh, this particular um, acyl chain, uh, phospholipid with this particular acyl chain. And uh, here I added different controls and uh, different phospholipid. So here we have the lipid of interest in incomplete media that doesn't have any lipid rich serum. And here I have phospholipids that, uh, that we know that are essential for the parasite growth. And here I have some negative controls and we have all here a complete media. And this is what, um, what I showed here. Uh, is that the percentage of the infected red blood cells, it elevated in the incomplete media that doesn't have any other lipids other than this particular lipid with this particular acyl chain. So you can see here that the proliferation of the parasite and the, uh, it has higher count across four different days uh, than the complete media and all the other controls. This is looking at all the infected uh, uh, red blood cells, if we separate them into the asexuals, we see that it, develop, uh, that it supports the development of these asexual parasites, and also it supports the development of gam gametes as well. And with that, I would like, because I passed my time, so I would like to uh, thank all the children and families in Burkina Faso, uh, and uh, also I would like to thank Yusuf, uh, the head of our group, and my lab members, and uh, I would like to thank uh, the Jane Carlton Lab for transferring the knowledge of uh, parasite culturing. And I'm not going to take more, more than this. I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> thank you.